The condition is what we call an associative agnosia, rather than an apperceptive one. That means it doesn't interfere with one's visual perception, only with the ability to recognize what one sees. A caliagnosic perceives faces perfectly well. He or she can tell the difference between a pointed chin and a receding one, a straight nose and a crooked one, clear skin and blemished skin. He or she simply doesn't experience any aesthetic reaction to those differences. It does feel different, by the way. Well, not like feel different, but, you know, as an artist, as a designer, as an appreciator of beauty, like when I, when I walked out of the brain zap room uh, and I saw the hot nurse up front, like, he just looked more plain. Like, he looked, he looked less hot. Like, it's, I could still tell that, you know, he was an attractive person, but, like, a lot of the spice, I guess, wasn't there anymore, which was super weird. But anyways, so, my name is Noah, and as of uh, two hours ago, I am officially Cali Agnostic. I'm part of the first public trial uh, who is able to talk about, you know, what it's like to undergo uh, not only the procedure of getting caliagnosia uh, put in my brain, but also what it's like to live with it for a week, at least. For those of you who aren't aware, caliagnosia predicted uh, by Ted Chang in his short story, Liking What You See, a documentary, uh, is essentially about a brain state where you are not able to perceive beauty or lack of beauty. You're not able to perceive things that are both traditionally seen as attractive uh, and things that are traditionally seen as unattractive, like facial symmetry is a great example, something that basically everyone in the world more or less agrees has some redeeming qualities. Uh, you're not also able to really tell if somebody has acne, if they have deformities or scars, if facial proportions might be non-traditional. But it's not that you don't notice they're there, it's that whatever kind of evolutionary reaction you have to what those what those things mean you just like you just kind of don't care like like again i saw the nurse for the second time when i walked out of the room first time in the room he just looked more plain everybody just kind of looks more plain like really evened out you know everybody looks not the same, but they kind of feel the same, if that makes sense, right? And I'm, and I'm not talking about like body shape, like weights or anything. Like I'm talking about from a facial perspective, I can tell if someone has bigger lips, a wider nose, rounder cheeks, a, a more angled jaw. But I guess I don't care. I guess I don't really care. Basically, the entire point of Ted Chang's story was to have a commentary on lookism and how just people being born with, you know, base levels of traditional attractiveness or uh, facial features seen as good or bad um, by society affects you in life. And... Now we have that in real life, which is crazy. It's crazy. It's wild. So, yeah, if you want to know more, read the short story. But uh, if you want to find out more about my dumb experience, uh, that's why I'm doing this whole thing. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be I'm going to be chatting about this for the next seven days. So I guess we'll see what happens. Shout out Ted Chang for predicting this, and Snapchat filters, same book, read this. I got asked to be taken off a client at work today. I 
I'm a designer. I work in advertising at, at the moment, you know, selling shit. Uh, and one of the clients I'm on is beauty related, skincare. Um, part of what I do is, you know, I help pick models, I do art direction, I do fun design things. And, you know, I've made no attempt to keep this a secret. Uh, my agency hasn't told me to like be quiet about it or anything. And, you know, because I've been doing this, there's been a little bit of buzz. And the client found out that I was the one working on their campaign. And they asked me to be taken off it. They asked me to be removed because during the course of this, they were concerned that I wouldn't be able to pick the right person to represent their product because of what I can't perceive for the next six days. And, you know, I wasn't told this, obviously. The agency told my superiors, and then they told me. And, of course, what they mean is uh, they think I'm going to pick someone ugly because I can't tell the difference, right? And it's just... It just really goes to show, honestly, I think, just how predatory advertising, and beauty in particular, cosmetics uh, is when it comes towards looks and how they want people to look, you know. There's, there's, there's a really good analogy from, from a person in uh, Ted Chang's book about um, how cocaine in its natural form, the leaves are appealing, but it's really nothing that special. Um, however, once you refine it, you know, do a bunch of stuff to it and turn it into cocaine, uh, then it's a problem. Then it is supercharged. And more or less the same thing has happened to beauty. You know, we have this evolutionary, uh, evolutionary circuit in our brains, which gives us a reaction to traditional traditional beauty, to things that we see as beautiful, as evolutionarily superior. And we've reached a point in our modern society between technology, uh, uh, the ethos around advertising, of selling things as a lifestyle, as something you can become. And, uh, and we've essentially reached a point where beauty has become supercharged. It's become cocaine. It's, we're, 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 we're losing our ability to appreciate someone who just looks good because we're continually being bombarded with these unrealistic, supercharged versions of what beauty looks like through some people who aren't even real, like Snapchat filters, uh, Photoshopping people, heavy retouching, even like specialized lighting can make people look so wildly different. You know, you take people who are already above the average and and dump all of this beauty enhancement on top of them and what do you get you get body image problems you get unrealistic societal expectations of what people should look like you get things like bulimia anorexia you get people killing themselves it's no wonder that you know the cosmetics industry both has predicted in this book and in real life are some of the biggest opponents of making Caliagnosia a more popular widespread thing because they rely so heavily on these unrealistic, unhealthy aspects of beauty that they wouldn't have a business without it. I was not taken off the project, by the way. So shout out to my agency. Other places absolutely would have bended. But it's just really interesting to think how many people, even growing up with this, you know, how many more people would still be alive 
how many more people would have better mental health if they weren't abused and tormented by the unrealistic expectations of beauty that advertising sets for us. You know, I think one of the things I was most looking forward to uh, trying this out is not how I perceive other people, but how I perceive myself. Because, you know, you can still look at your own face in the mirror, obviously. My favorite, my favorite passage from the book was a little interview from a dude named Warren. And he grew up without Caliagnosia, but he tried it out once he got to college. And he talks about how he hated how he looks. He doesn't like how he looks. It gave him a lot of ang a lot of anxiety, you know, not necessarily because people thought he looked like a freak, uh, but because he thought people thought looked this. He thought, people thought he looked like a freak because he didn't like how he looked. And he talked about how getting Cali made it so he didn't care as much about how he looked. And God, that hit home super hard because I never really thought about it like in that way un until I read that. But God, did I have awful self-esteem problems when I was younger. I hated how I looked. I hated how I sound. I still don't like how I sound. And now I've had a bit of a glow up, obviously, but so much of my anxiety was because I thought other people thought I looked like some sort of goblin that crawled out of a gutter, you know? Like, assuming people just thought that I looked like a freak. Uh tanked my quality of life, made it impossible to interact with people, particularly, you know, people I thought were attractive because I was like, oh, no way that they could possibly like me or think I'm just a normal ass person. And man, man, that hurt, that hurt a lot. But it's also interesting because while at the time I absolutely would have taken the treatment to make my brain hate myself less now, like that I've glowed up, I've developed more self-esteem, I've become, I've become uh, much closer to a person I would like to look at and I'm not just counting the lots of cool tattoos I have. Just coming to terms with like my face and how I look and the fact that like I look pretty okay. Now that I look at myself in the mirror, like there's a sense of ambivalence towards it. Like it's almost like the amount of personal growth I've put in is kind of gone uh, looking at myself. There's just that net neutrality. But at the same time, I wonder if I had, you know, grown up on Cali. Uh, if I wouldn't have had to do that work in the first place, if I wouldn't have had to work hard to come to terms with myself, if I would have just thought that I was good, I was okay, I was fine, there was nothing wrong with me, I just looked different. I don't know. I don't know. As predicted, uh, there are people who are calling Caliagnosia political correctness, uh, punishing people for their natural talents, their natural gifts, you know? People saying, oh, who doesn't enjoy being in the presence of a world-class beauty the way that they enjoy uh, watching an Olympian break a record or hearing the, the vocal talents of a professional singer? And... Like, I just think that's so stupid. Some people are objectively born 
worse off in the looks department. That's just how it is. I believe everybody can find somebody who can love them, who love them for who they are, but let's not joke around that if you have some like unfortunate deformity or if you're just like facial structure looks different enough to the mean population that you happen to inhabit that you won't be at some sort of disadvantage subtly or otherwise right like you can train to be a good singer you can train to be an athlete my my lazy ass could theoretically uh train to uh i don't know be a really good pole vaulter or some shit right like you can't train to change your face, you know? You can't change how you are born from a bone structure department. We haven't gotten that far into the future yet. And I think, I think the main point that these people are missing as they miss with everything is that this is just another means potentially of evening the playing field, you know? Like what inspired Ted to write the short story is there was an experiment run by scientists where there was a resume left in an airport or something. And the scientists who left it there, uh, every now and then they changed the picture. And they would change the picture to people more traditionally attractive versus someone more non-traditionally attractive or ugly, however you want to put it. And when the person was hotter, the resume was put in the mail a lot more. You know, we've seen this countless times. Attractive people feel more trustworthy. Attractive people just get away with more stuff in general. Like, lookism is a real thing. It's absolutely a real thing. And to an extent, sure, you can change how you dress. You can wear your hair differently. You can do makeup. You can work with what you have. But that doesn't change the fact that ultimately some people are just born with a disadvantage because of how society operates and how we treat different aspects of beauty. And this is a way to level the playing field, theoretically. You know, I, I don't necessarily agree that like the whole entire society should be on it all the time. To be honest, I don't really have a hard opinion either way. I just think this whole thing is interesting, but I think that the notion that we could potentially have a means to level the playing field in some way for some people could be really interesting. You know, I'd be interested in seeing where that goes. In the book, uh, one of the main people that, that, that the story follows is a girl called Tamara who has been on Caliagnosis since she was a kid. Uh, she went to a school filled with Caliagnostic people. And there were a lot of children there who had like deformities or problems or could be classified as non-traditional attractive ugly ass kids and largely they they reported a significantly higher quality of life because they were getting picked on all the time because kids are mean as shit so the fact that like that's a way of making theoretically one of the meanest groups of society uh not care as much about superficial things it's just a really interesting thing to think about, you know? Some people call it like enforced maturity, but I don't know. I don't know. I think society is so complicated, you know? Like we've, we've, we've been using technology to torment ourselves for so long. Like we have the potential to use it to, I don't know, make things a little better for some people. It's worth seeing what that can do. One of my other favorite passages from Ted's story is a little excerpt from a woman named Lori who says to, quote, uh, go radical ugly, Caliagnosia is for wusses. And I love that. She said that she straight up got her nose removed and got like a fake bone put in the place because if the real bone was sticking out, it, was, it would get infected. And she talks about how ultimately it's just about attention, right? 
Like people can't stop looking at you if you're super beautiful. If you're also super fucking ugly or deformed, people also can't look at you. So you should embrace that. Go radical ugly. And I think she's 1 million percent right. Ultimately, beauty is about attention. It circles back to advertising. It circles back to how we view people, you know? We can't stop looking at people. We can't stop looking at these beautiful faces or these ugly faces. And that's why they're everywhere. They're in our advertisements. They're even all over social media. That's why every shitty thumbnail has some like insane face on it. That's usually of a really hot person or of a really ugly person if it's a really mean-spirited video. There are never any just normal looking people, or if there are, like, nobody watches it most of the time. It's about the attention economy. It's about getting that attention, you know? Beauty equals views, effectively. Beauty is about getting noticed. And if you just look normal, you will get no attention if you look super hot or if you look super ugly you're going to get all the attention and i think that that is an amazing indicator of how we as a society value and judge what we want to give our attention to those extremes again the cocaine of beauty make the cocaine of ugliness you know maybe it could be a means of normalizing everything but I don't know, is an extreme in the other direction to counter an extreme in one direction? Does that really equal out and make zero? Probably not, but I think the notion is really fun to think about. I want to get a lot more tattoos, but I don't know if I get my nose removed. That sounds a little bit much, but who knows? Maybe we'll get there one day. You know, I feel like if everybody had Cali Agnosia, the world, like, really wouldn't be better. Like, sure, it's a modification that will ultimately help people, but we're not, like, learning anything. There's no, like, lesson we're, 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 we're developing. We're just, like, turning something off, you know? Like, racism isn't going to go away. There won't be some great revelation about, oh my god, we shouldn't treat people um, differently based on how they look. We should spread that into other aspects of life. We'll just continue to exist in our prejudiced nature, just maybe in one less way. Like, if everybody in the world except one person had... Cali Agnosia, that person without it would get away with so much shit and we wouldn't be able to tell, you know? Even in smaller groups, if there was like a team at someone's job and all the underlings had Cali Agnosia and the person in power did not, excuse me, that person could get away with abusing their power to like promote the hot people or whatever and no one would be the wiser. Like, unless literally everybody in the world had it, there will be discrimination based on looks. And I don't know what the solution would be to that. I mean, there's no way they can... They can do that to the whole world, and even if they did, like, again, there's all these other things that we hate about people. Would it really change? Using this absolutely does give some people a better quality of life. In the book, there is a school that one of the main people, Tamara, went with where all of the kids had Cali Agnosia. And kids who had deformities, who had scars, uh, you know, Things to make them less, um, um, I don't want to say less attractive because they're kids and that's weird, but things that kids would make fun of, right? Like all of these, all of these kids in that school reported a higher quality of life because 
the meanest sect of humanity, children couldn't really tell that they had some kind of problem. Which is amazing, of course. God knows their quality of life is so much better. Their esteem is so much better about the way they look. But when those kids grow up and they go into other places without it, then, I mean, it could be a nightmare. It could be a nightmare because they don't know how to recognize when they're being discriminated against. I don't know. There's no right answer. It's just interesting and scary. No. One of the uh, one of the one of the pivotal moments of the book. Spoilers, by the way, but honestly, if you don't see something like this happening, then it's your loss. Uh, one of the pivotal moments of the book is a debate on the college campus between someone who is the spokesperson for the pro. Cali movement and someone who is anti-Cali. And each of them give their speeches. And then after the speeches, there is a vote as to whether um, the referendum to make Cali mandatory school-wide or keep it as optional occurs. And the anti-Cali movement wins. Cali remains optional. It is not mandatory at the school. It won by a landslide. It was like 65% or something. And it was later revealed that the speech, the televised speech given by both of the students, the, the person who was anti cali had their speech manipulated digitally. They had their body language enhanced. They had their inflection enhanced. They were basically given like Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. levels of riz to how they carried themselves and how they spoke. And I think that is A, terrifying, uh, B, ironic, of course, that a movement that is... Um, there's a movement that is anti, basically modifying how people view other people would do that. And also, it is scary because this absolutely feels like something that could happen in real life. It feels like there's something that is possibly being worked on right now. You know, the beauty industry is freaking out about the potential of this. But it really goes to show, honestly, I think the biggest takeaway from that is that it doesn't matter what people say most of the time. It matters who is saying it and how. It's been proven time and time and again that, you know, more attractive people appear nicer. They appear more trustworthy. And of course, if somebody has if somebody has the sauce, uh, if somebody just has incredible power when they speak incredible presence, then that can give so much weight to absolute bullshit, to just the dumbest possible things. But people will believe it because they got that spice. They got that juice. It doesn't matter what anybody's actually saying. It just matters how they're saying it and potentially who is saying it. I think if Cali does become more popular, which I've, I, I foresee it, it becoming, there will absolutely be more of a push to get around that. Advertisers will do more scummy, shitty things to get people to buy their dumb, useless products to make you feel better about your empty, shallow life. And that is terrifying. We already have things like Snapchat filters, all sorts of filters that modify the face, modify the body, all things that mask 
over people's faces or body parts, things that track on screen. This is a rudimentary version of that technology, and oh boy, that is coming. We are approaching an age where we don't know what is real, where we have even less, we have even less awareness of if we are being manipulated, if we are being lied to. Callie, Callie, Callie has a lot of potential to do, to do good for people who are just dealt a bad hand, and that's amazing. But we live in a society that is inherently exploitative, run by industries who don't give a shit about us. And I think unintentionally, this tool could enable more ways for us to simply just get fucked over. And that's scary. There's a lot of talk on how, like, people are saying uh, 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 that Cali Agnosia will lower your standards or some shit. And it reminds me of another passage, which uh, I'm just going to read. It's from a super, like, misogynistic college bro guy. Amazing. I want to date good-looking girls. Same. Why would I ever want something that would make me lower my standards? Okay, sure, some nights all the babes have been taken and you have to choose from the leftovers. But that's why there's beer, right? Doesn't mean I want to wear beer goggles all the time. Hilarious. But also, at the same time, how wrong is he? We all want to date people that we think are hot, that we think are attractive, right? Obviously, this idiot doesn't actually understand how it works, even in this fictional world. But just think about how many interactions we've had, romantic or otherwise, that have been, you know, purely based on how somebody looks, how approachable they might seem, even on a subconscious level. Forget about weights height, skin, color, any, anything like that. How many interactions are dictated purely by how cute someone's face is, right? Just think of like all the dating apps, you know? That, that first picture somebody sees, right? It could be huge. You get swiped and go in the dumpster or you get swiped and you have a potential interaction because of how you look. How you look is basically the catalyst to get to know someone on a deeper level in so many circumstances. And imagine if that went away. Imagine how many more interactions we would have, how, 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 how much bigger communities would be, how much easier it would be to approach people or make friends, in the case of Warren or younger me. Um, having a better feeling about yourself would cause you to instigate things more. Like, we all like looking at hot people. I love looking at hot people. That's why I look at my partner all the time. Give me, gives me butterflies, but at, at the same time, it's, it's like, how many other friends or other relationships that I had had. How different would my life have been if I had just been able to approach, I don't know, so many other people, purely because their looks weren't a factor or my self-esteem of my looks weren't a factor. We all deserve to be with people we find attractive, right? But it shouldn't just be about your face. I mean, I can still see if someone has a fat ass, and that's important to me. I'm kidding, but um, I'm, I'm not kidding. Well, as of uh, an hour ago, again, I'm back to normal, baby, just as evolution decided. That was an interesting week. That was a really interesting week. 
perceiving the world like that was both like like really really small but also like huge changing changing my mindset about a lot of stuff i I'd say one of the main things I noticed just right off the dome was I was a lot less susceptible to advertising and like all the internet algorithms that continually force you to click on content because it's all faces. It's all faces and now like, well, now I care again. But then I didn't, you know, it felt, it felt really good. Like, like a piece of my ADHD was turned off for a while. I got the chance to talk to some of the other people as well. We kind of did like a little round table. There was an older person who, uh, who talked about their experiences, how, you know, when they were younger, they probably wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have done this because they, they loved how they looked then. Obviously, aging, getting used to that, something that I'm going to find out eventually changes how, how you see yourself when, like, skin starts to sag and joints don't work as well and you're just natural beauty kind of, I don't know, fades a bit. And it was interesting to hear that, yeah, they kind of did feel a little bit better about or a little more ambivalent about how they looked now, but at a point, they, they didn't really care that much. Sure, the the potential to not like look over old people as being like less valuable than younger people could be a certain positive, but it was just interesting to hear them, them, them talk uh, also about myself as an artist and how that might affect me because there there have been thoughts that there could be some spillover for this, right? Like what other things could this be connected? Like I didn't really notice anything outside of obviously me not really caring as much about like certain particulars of people's faces, but I didn't really feel like my work, my arts uh, in, impacted in any conceivable way. You know, I made sure to work on some stuff and I looked at it almost as soon as I got home because I was fascinated and I still thought damn this is great I'm a genius so at least at least for me it didn't happen <sighs> yeah there was there's there's a lot more that I, I want to talk about but obviously there's like a time limit that I have for this sort, sort of thing please read the book it covers a lot of really interesting things. Uh, read the news to hear about all this insane shenanigans that we are in the process of living through. This was a really interesting experience. Uh, but I'm going to be real. I'm glad that I can see all the little idiosyncrasies in people again. I can see all those little elements that kind of make someone unique, lucky or, or otherwise, you know. Obviously, I'm sure if somebody with like a scar across their face was sitting here, they would say something different. You know, in fact, a person in, in the study did have something like that, and they did say something different. I think that's what's fascinating about this, is that everybody who experiences it undergoes a a different sense of discovery about themselves and the world. And... At the very least, I hope a lot more people get to try this, whether it should be widespread or whether it should be buried and lost to time. Uh, the future will tell, but yeah. Is that it? Is that the end? Can I like take this off now? Cool. Ugh. God, I hate being in front of the camera. Jesus Christ.